thanks, thanks everyone for being with us this evening. And sorry, we were a few minutes late starting. Um, as usual, technical hitches, but anyhow, we're here. And I'd like to start by thanking my neighbors who've got us started on what we can do as gardeners to help native pollinators. Um, it's scary worldwide, the overall decline in insects as much as 45%. And, you know, it, there's such trickle down effects like for insect eating birds and of course for our food supply because of pollination. So at least we're taking a start where we're starting in our backyards. So I'm especially grateful to Salt Spring Foundation for supporting us and also for Transition Salt Spring for their help in getting this presentation underway. Um, before Bonnie starts her presentation, I'd take a moment to acknowledge and respect that the land we live on um, is the unceded territory of the Hopanam and Sichuthin speaking people. And we're grateful for that. And we're particularly grateful, as I said, to the foundation and um, to Transition Salt Spring. And in the chat, if you're declined, if you're inclined to support them as they've supported us, um, there will be how to donate is in the chat. So turning now to Bonnie, uh, presenter Bonnie Zand, um, we're really fortunate to have her. Um, she's a big wheel in the Native Society, Native Bee Society of BC. And maybe Bonnie, I'll just hand it to you and you can tell us a bit about yourself and then straight into the bees. I think you're just setting up your presentation. There we go. Yes. Unmuting myself. Wonderful. I will just get this presentation going. Uh, but thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really lovely to be able to be here uh, and to share with a group of people who are trying to make a difference and who are passionate uh, about bees and other insects. I'm just going to get this going. Does this look all right? Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to talk to you today about gardening for pollinators uh, and specifically about supporting BC's diverse native bees. Uh, and I work, um, as Anne said, with the Native Bee Society of BC, uh, which is a collective of scientists, artists, managers, and enthusiasts. And we're all working to promote the conservation of native bees uh, here in BC. And so I'm on the board of directors for the society. Uh, and we have a bunch of things. If, if this presentation gets you interested uh, in native bees and you'd like to learn more, uh, we have a BCB course that's coming up next week. Uh, we do bee walks. We also do regular online events once a month. We have an online native bee study group where we talk about the different bees we're seeing and the plants they're using. And the society also supports the Master Melitologist program, uh, which is a master gardener type program, but for native bees. And so for anyone who's interested in some really in-depth native bee study, that's a great way to do it. Uh, and as well, we have some other uh, citizen science initiatives. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, some of those as we go through. As well as my work with the Native Bee Society of BC, I am also a private consultant. Uh, and so I have um, a business called Bonnie's Bugs IPM. And so I work on Vancouver Island. Uh, and I do a number of different projects. Uh, one that might be of interest to this group is I'm currently working on a project looking at what pollinators are present in Vancouver Island agricultural systems. Uh, so this is a project that's uh, looking at some samples that have been collected over the past two years from 19 different farms. And we're working to create a baseline data set on what bees we currently have. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this project as well and why it's important uh, to know what we have uh, and to be able to use that information to contribute to conservation. And you can, you can get more information about that project there. So today, what I'm gonna talk about 
is I'm going to talk about our native bees and what we can do to help them. And I'm going to start with why do we care about bees? I'll follow that up by talking about who are the bees? How are the bees doing? Which is a question I get asked quite frequently. What are some of the threats facing pollinators and native bees? And finally, how can you support pollinators? So why do we care about bees? I think most people uh, know the answer to this one. It's pollination. Uh, and so pollination is the movement of pollen from one plant to another or within the same plant. Um, and that allows the plant to set seeds and it's also required for them to produce fruit. And this is very important for a lot of the foods uh, that we as people like to eat. Uh, all of the best food requires pollination. So that's things like apples, um, berries, uh, our fruits like zucchini and tomatoes, uh, but also many of our crops come from seeds that also require pollination. And as well, if we want to kind of step away from a human centric perspective, bees are very important for ecosystem health. Uh, and that's because pollination of wild plants is required for them to set seeds and exchange genetic material. Uh, and that allows all of our ecosystems to continue to function and to continue to propagate themselves. And so bees do a huge service for us. But it's a bit of a, a it's not how they see it. So for plants, pollination is absolutely essential for reproduction. But for bees, pollination is just a byproduct of grocery shopping. Bees collect pollen from plants, not because they care about the future of those plants, but because pollen is a protein rich substance that they use to feed their young. They also collect nectar from plants and nectar is the reward that the plants are using to try and draw the bees in and have them come and collect and move that pollination. Uh, so here, this I think this uh, cartoon illustrates that very well. The plant is saying, thank you for carrying my game mates to my lover. And the bees just don't make a weird man. Uh, and so when we think about pollination and we think about the roles that bees have in pollination, both in our natural ecosystems and in our agricultural systems, the bee that we usually think about is this one, the honeybee. And honeybees are very important to agricultural pollination. But what many people don't realize is that honeybees are actually an introduced species. So they are not native here in North America. They are brought over with settlers from Europe uh, and they are a managed species. And so they're more like livestock than like a wild species. Uh, and so they do contribute a lot to pollination but wild bees or native bees do as well. And so when I'm talking about native bees, I'm talking about bees that have a long-standing ecological relationship with this territory, this land. They're from here, nobody brought them here. Uh, and a recent study looking at the contributions of wild bees to agricultural pollination came up with a, a number for that contribution and they figured that wild bees worldwide uh, put, provide about $3,000 per hectare in pollination services to agricultural crops. And that's about equivalent to the contribution that this study calculated for honeybees. And so just that out there, our wild bees are very important to pollination, not just for native plants and native ecosystems, but also for the food that we eat. Uh, and particularly in my work on Vancouver Island, uh, I see a lot of native bees uh, in the fields of the farms here. Uh, and we do have a great agricultural systems here where there's a really nice balance between agricultural lands and wild lands uh, where native pollinators can thrive. And so even though honeybees are important, I really want us to focus on our native bees. And often, you know, there's a lot of push to uh, save the bees and do things to help the bees. And that's really great that people are aware of the importance of pollinators and are trying to respond to that. But too often that response gets directed towards honeybees. 
And it's because honeybees as an agricultural species have a pretty strong lobby uh, and they're able to attract a lot of attention. And so one of my goals during this talk is to have you kind of get to know and to understand all the other bees and the importance of all of the other bees and to start acting some activities towards all of those other species that are not our managed honeybees. So from there, let's talk about who are these bees that I'm talking about? Who are the native bees? So here are a few of the native bees. Uh, and so I'm just putting this slide up to show you the incredible diversity that is present in native bees here in BC and elsewhere around the world. Uh, and so we've got species that vary greatly in size. We've got big bumblebees, tiny little resins. Uh, we have bees that look a lot like wasps, but this one over here is indeed a bee. And we have bees that many people would think were flies. This love green metallic bee here. Uh, this one's mason bee, which is one that many of you are probably familiar with or have heard about. And we also have leaf cutter bees. So this is just a, a quick sampling of some of the diversity in size, color, and shape that we have here in BC. And as a matter of fact, Quaker uh, BC has over 500 different species of native bees. Honeybees is only one species. And then here we have 500 that are naturally occurring here. Nobody had to bring them in. Nobody has to manage them. Uh, they have their long-standing evolutionary relationships with the plants and the landscapes that they live in. And BC has the highest diversity in Canada. And one of the reasons for that is because BC itself is super diverse. And so we have both coastal areas, we have mountains, uh, we have uh, northern boreal areas, we have our deserts in the Okanagan. And each of those regions will have different bees associated with them that are adapted to those habitats. And our highest bee diversity in BC is in the interior at around 400 species. Uh, and we're not totally sure how many bee species currently occur on Vancouver Island, uh, perhaps somewhere around 100. Uh, but this is one of the many things that we don't know yet. And there's always more things that we're trying to learn about our native bees. So given that we have so many different native bees, how can we understand that bee diversity? And I could give you a lot of scientific terms that we use to describe this. I could tell you that in BC, we've got six different families of bees. Um, I could tell you all of their scientific names and classifications, uh, but I think you'll probably understand, appreciate it better uh, if I talk about functional groups. And so these are groups based on lifestyles, on adapt pollen carrying adaptations, on nesting types. Uh, and these are things that you can see in your garden and you can observe and start to, to understand to put bees into these categories. So the first thing we can think about is how do bees interact with one another? And some of our native bees are what we call social bees. And this is what, again, the picture we tend to have in our heads when we're thinking about bees based on honeybees is a colony. The queen who does all the egg laying and workers who do all of the other work. And we do have some navies here in BC that have a life cycle that is similar to that. And those are our bumblebees. And our bumblebees live in a colony with a queen and workers. And this is a picture. And like honeybees, our bumblebees create wax. They're not quite as organized as honeybees. So it's more a collection of pots than an orderly comb. Uh, and these bumblebees work together collaboratively to care for the offspring. A difference between bumblebees and honeybees is that bumblebees have a one-year life cycle for their colony. And so in the fall, the bumblebee queens, new bumblebee queens will be produced by the colony, they'll mate, and they'll fly away from the colony and find a safe place to spend the winter in hibernation. So this might be under a pile of leaves or in a compost pile, or we don't even really often know where they're spending the winter. The rest of the bumblebee colony will die. All of the workers, all of the males. 
early in the spring when you see those really, really big bumblebees buzzing around on those early spring warm days. Those are those queens that have overwintered. They've woken up, they've come out, and now they're going to initiate a new colony for the season. And at this stage of their life cycle, those queen bees are essentially single moms. They have to do everything. They find a space for the colony. They build the first wax pots. They collect all the food for those first babies. They lay the eggs. And then they actually will keep those, that first nest warm by hovering over the eggs and shivering their wing muscles to generate heat, uh, to keep that brood alive and warm and growing. And once those first brood emerge, that's the workers. And at that point, that queen bumblebee can kind of relax a bit uh, and the workers will carry on with doing the foraging um, and the colony maintenance. And the queen can just settle down into an egg laying role. And so this, this is the closest thing that we're used to thinking about in terms of how bees live. But actually most of our bees are not social and they do not cooperate and they don't have a queen and a worker. And so most of our native bees are what we call solitary bees. And this is 90% of our species. And in a solitary bee life cycle, each bee for her entire life, entire life is that single mom. Every female bee finds a space to build a nest. She collects the pollen that's gonna feed her offspring. She also lays the eggs. Um, and then sometimes she'll even do a little bit of garden behavior where she may like hang out at the entrance to the nest to keep other bees out. And she also doesn't do much care for her offspring. You know, other than that little bit of nest guarding, uh, essentially what she will do uh, is she will collect pollen. And this is a sample here of a single nest cell in a tunnel nesting bee. I'm gonna talk about tunnel nesting a little more. And so she's created a ball of pollen here, made many trips to flowers collecting that pollen. She's laid an egg on that ball of pollen, and then she's actually sealed this nesting cell off. Uh, and so in this case, there's a series of them. Here's one behind, she's created a wall. Here's a second cell, there'll be another wall here, and she'll carry on in this tunnel. And inside each of those cells, the baby bees develop without any interaction with their mother or their siblings. Uh, so this is a baby bee, a little larva, and it's eating this ball of pollen that's been left by its mother. After it's consumed all of the pollen, uh, that baby bee will pupate, uh, which is the stage where they transform into an adult bee. Uh, and once they're an adult bee and the conditions are right, then they will chew their way out of this tunnel and go forth, mate, and repeat the cycle without ever having any interaction with their mother. And so this is, this is super different than that social life cycle, but this is how most of them do it. Another thing I often get asked is about stings and do bees sting and do native bees sting? And solitary bees like these, because they are not part of a large colony uh, and because they're not defending that big colony and defending a queen, uh, they're capable of stinging, but they're very gentle very unlikely to sting you unless you really like grab them and squish them and their lives are in danger. Uh, so these are our very gentle bees. And so they're really fun to watch and get up close to. In addition to our social and our solitary bees, we also have what's called parasitic bees. Uh, and so I've got an example of one here. This is a nomada bee. Uh, and if you looked at this, you would probably never think that it was a bee. Uh, it doesn't look very fuzzy. It looks more like a wasp. Uh, and this bee actually has no adaptations for carrying pollen. And that's because she doesn't collect any. So unlike the other bees I've been talking about that are very busy flying from flower to flower, collecting pollen, bringing it home, um, producing nest cells, what this bee does is she looks for the nests of another bee of a different species. And she will wait around outside that nest until the hardworking mother bee has left. And that's her cue to nip into that nest cell and lay her own egg on the pollen collected by the other species. And most of the bees, you saw the photo in the previous slide, the bee larva are kind of look like legless grubs. You know, they don't really have much of anything. All they do is eat. 
Uh, the difference with these, the parasitic bees, is that often the larva of these bees will have giant jaws. Uh, and that's because the first job of the larva of these parasitic bees is to kill the other larva that's in that nest so that they can have the entire pollen ball all to themselves. And so these are slightly gruesome, but really fascinating bees. And even though it seems like maybe we would not want to have these bees around, I'm actually always really happy when I see them because these are the, the top predators in our bee world. And I know that when I'm seeing a high number of parasitic bees or cuckoo bees, that that means that there's lots of their hosts present. And so that, that bee population is probably doing okay in general, that they can support these parasitic bees. So those are a few things you can watch for, try and figure out whether you're seeing a social or a solitary or a parasitic bee. Another thing that you can look at when you're watching bees in your garden, which I encourage you all to do because it's super fascinating, is you can look and say, where do they carry their pollen? Uh, and this also provides some clues about what type of bee they are. Um, so we have some bees that are what we call corbiculate bees. And that means they have a special structure on their back leg uh, and it's a pollen basket. It's a smooth area with a fringe of hairs going up around it. And these bees are able to pack pollen into that basket and they mix it with nectar and pack it in and create this very compact, discrete pellet. So if you've ever bought bee pollen from a store, you probably remember it comes in these big pellets. And those are because honeybees, which is who, where that pollen is collected from, are corbiculate bees. That's how they carry their pollen. And so are bumblebees. Honeybees and bumblebees are fairly closely related. And so if you see a bee, a big fuzzy bee flying around and it's got this big pellet of pollen on its back leg, you know that it is either a honeybee or a bumblebee. And if it's big and fuzzy, it's probably a bumblebee. So that's one thing you can look for. Another way, that many of our bees carry pollen uh, is the pollen pants bee way. And so here again, the pollen is collected on the back leg, but instead of one specialized area where the pollen is collected wet, their legs are covered with many, many hairs and the pollen is packed dry into those hairs. And so you can see it does look like this bee uh, is just wearing pollen. She's got it all on her leg, all up and up tucked on her, thorax under her wing here as well. Uh, and so these bees, because they're carrying pollen dry, um, sometimes that pollen is also more likely to come off uh, and to spread. And so often bees, uh, other than honeybees, bees that carry pollen in other ways are often more efficient pollinators on a per bee basis because they're not as good at storing and keeping that pollen for themselves. But have a look, see, see where you can see bees carrying their pollen. And then we have the hairy belly bees. And so these are always a big hit when I'm talking to school kids, uh, fun things to look for. And so as the name suggests, these bees have pollen carrying hairs under their abdomen or under their belly. So you can see it here, um, these, these tufts of hair. And in this picture with uh, this leaf cutter bee on this sunflower, you can see all the yellow all underneath of her. That's the pollen and she's carrying it tucked up under her abdomen. And so bees in this group are kind of fun for another reason, besides getting to call them hairy belly bees. These are also our bees that tend to have big jaws. Uh, and they have big jaws because they make the most interesting nests and they do it with so many different interesting materials. Uh, so these include things like mason bees uh, and leaf cutter bees. And so here you can see a leaf cutter bee and she's using these big jaws that she has to cut circles of leaves out of your plants. So if you ever see these perfectly circular holes uh, cut out of your plants, that may be the work of one of our hairy belly bees. And a lot of our hairy belly bees are tunnel nesters. And so this means that they are going to build their nests in tunnels or crevices that have already been created by some other species. In nature, this would be things like holes dri drilled by beetles um, in wood. Uh, in our uh, human environments, these are often 
mason bee blocks where there's holes drilled. These may also be things like crevices under your shingles, um, I, where your windows open and close, your casement windows. I found them in those spaces. Uh, someone once told me she had some fling the holes um, of her sprinkler. Um, any, anywhere they can find a tunnel that's the right size. These also use stems. You know, empty and hollow stems will be also be used. And a lot of these tunnel nesting bees use different things to create their nest cells. And so our social bees, our honeybees and our bumblebees use wax to hold their babies and to create their nests. Uh, but there's many other materials that are used. And so this is, this is a wooden nest block that has holes drilled in it and someone has opened it up to take pictures. And we have three different bee species using this. So here at the bottom, and this is a mason bee. And so we can see each of these cells that the mason bee mom made and she's filled the um, partitions between the cells are made out of mud that she's gathered using her big jaws. And what we're seeing right now are cocoons. So this, this is in the winter. Uh, these baby bees have eaten all of the pollen, they've spun a cocoon, and now they're waiting here in this nest for spring when they're gonna chew their way out. Uh, this one here in the middle is a resin bee. And so she's done the same thing, created a series of nest cells, each one with a ball of pollen and an egg. But what she's created the partitions out of is actually plant resins uh, that she's brought in and molded and shaped here. And again, these are the baby bees. They've eaten all of the pollen uh, and now they're waiting for their time to emerge. And then here at the top, we have that leaf cutter. And so this is what she's doing with those big pieces of leaf. Uh, is she is building little wallpapered rooms for her offspring to keep them in there safe and secure with their ball of pollen. And so there's a number of different cells in here made out of leaves. Uh, so you can watch for these, see if you've got bees coming and going out of little holes, look for bees carrying pieces of leaves. Um, sometimes they make chewed up leaves or even chewed up flower petals, uh, which are really beautiful. But even though those tunnel nests are the nests that are the most obvious and the easiest to see, 70% of our native bee species are actually ground nesters. Uh, and so they are going to be digging a tunnel down into the ground. And I've got a diagram here uh, of one of our common species, the green metallic sweat bee, and it will dig a tunnel down and then it will dig side tunnels off to the side. And at the end of those side tunnels, there'll be a little room, which again, she will have a pollen ball, she'll create, she'll put it in that room, she'll lay her egg on top of it, and then she'll backfill that tunnel and actually seal that baby in. The baby bee, without any interaction with its parents, will eat the pollen, pupate, wait until it's time for it to come out again as an adult, and then it will dig its way back up out of the dirt. Uh, and I've just got a little video here to show you of, there she is, a little ground nesting bee. And so you can see she, she's living in a very sandy ecosystem. She's got her hole here under a plant. And let's just see if it'll go again. There we go. And so you can see she's coming out and pushing the soil back. Uh, so sometimes you'll just see a fan of soil. Sometimes they make little mounds. Uh, these ones are fun to watch for. And again, we don't realize it, but 70% of our bees do this ground nesting. And there she is one more time. There we go. So that's how they nest. That's the kinds of life cycles they have, but what flowers do they use? And this is another place where we can have different sorts of specializations. And so about 75% of our bees are what we call generalists. And so these are bees that will go to most any flower that's available. They're not particularly picky. They can use the pollen from many different types of flowers to rear their young. And so this is an orange-legged furrow bee here using an introduced blackberry flower. But we also have some bees that are called specialists. And specialist bees are only able to use the pollen from a small subset of plants. So that might be a family, that might be a genus, sometimes that might be one species of plant that that bee needs. And if that bee's plant host isn't present in an ecosystem or in a yard, that bee will not be able to live there either. It can only raise its offspring using the pollen from that one flower. 
Uh, so this is an example of the snowberry bee. And as the name suggests, this bee is a specialist on snowberry. And if snowberry is not present, this bee will not be present. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about specialist bees and how we wanna be kind of keeping them in our minds when we're planning our gardens a little later on. But how are the bees doing? And so this is, this is the question uh, that I get asked a lot. And the answer is, it's hard to know. This is some data, and I'm sorry about the graph. This is the only graph in the presentation, uh, but this is some data uh, from the report on the status of wild species in Canada in 2015. And so they attempted to figure out how all of the different species in Canada were doing. And this is the data on the bees. And so the first thing you can see is that BC has the most bees in Canada. We, we top the charts in number of bees. And the next thing to see this orange and red bars, those are species that are vulnerable or worse. And so in BC, they ranked 430 species, which we already know we have more species than that. 35% of the species that they were able to rank were vulnerable or worse. So that's a third of the species. But more concerning to me is that 31% of the species, this gray bar here at the bottom, were unranked. And so those are species where there was insufficient data to be able to determine how secure those populations were. And as I said, they didn't look at all the species. So there's a number of additional species that haven't been ranked at all yet. And species where they don't have enough information are likely to be species that are small, maybe species that are very specialized in certain habitats um, or on certain plants. And so we don't know a lot about them. And so we don't know how they're doing, but they're often the species that are gonna be most at risk. And as I was saying on Vancouver Island, we don't even know what all the species we have are. And so we run into this issue where how can we know how something is doing when we don't know if we have it? We're often lacking baseline data on what species are present. And so we can't tell if that species population is increasing, decreasing, or something else. And we can't tell if new species are coming in. We don't even have that baseline data. Uh, and so this is something that the Native Bee Society uh, is concerned about. And we do have an iNaturalist project. Uh, that is, we're using to try and track bee populations here in BC. And if you haven't used iNaturalist, I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's a pretty fun, free community science platform. You take pictures, you upload them to the, the platform. And if it's a picture of a bee and it's from BC, it will automatically be added to our Native Bee Society of BC Bee Tracker project. Uh, and you can also check this project out and see what species have all been found. Uh, and so this is a good deal of fun. It can help you to learn more about the species that are in your garden and in your yard. And this data is also valuable for scientists to be able to track the introduction of new species and changes in species distributions. The one drawback of this is that it is photo-based. And for a lot of our species, especially our small ones, uh, they actually do need to be captured and looked at under a microscope in order to be able to identify them. Uh, and so this is, there we go. This is my project that I'm working on here on Vancouver Island, where I did that. I went to these different farms. I collected bee specimens using traps. You can see one here. It's a blue vein trap. Uh, we had these traps out three times a year on each of the farms because we have different bees in the spring and in the summer and in the fall, depending on when they come out and when their associated plants are present. And so we collected a large number of samples from these 19 farms. Uh, and this project was supported by the Vancouver Island Pest Pollinators and Beneficials Project, which was a project of the Climate Change Adaptation Program. Uh, and so it ran for 2021 and 2022. Uh, and now in 2023, I am working on going through those samples and seeing what species we had and which ones are present on which farms. Uh, and this project is being currently being supported by donations from uh, different gardening clubs, bee clubs, uh, farmers institutes, and thanks to some donations from the Coombs Farmers Institute and the Bainstown Garden Club, 
we were able to get a species list for one of the 19 farms. Uh, and so on that one farm, we pulled out 21 different species. And so this is the list here. And if you'd like to see the list, uh, if you follow either this QR code or this link, you can get to a page with more information about this project. And as we work through more farms, we'll be adding to it there. But this is our, our start to create that baseline data. What bees are present in Vancouver Island agriculture? So we can go back later and say, is it changing? Are we losing species? Are we getting new species? Uh, and you can see out of those 21 species on that one farm, we had ground nesting bees, stem nesting bees, cavity nesting bees. We had both social, solitary, and parasitic bees. And we had bees coming out at all the different times of year. And so uh, this list is also potentially helpful. I know you're on Salt Spring, so none of our farms were from Salt Spring, but we do have some farms uh, in the Saanich Peninsula and up in the Comox Valley and the Cowichan Valley. Uh, and so similar species may be present in your yards and gardens. So this is a, a preliminary list. You could have a look and see if you can spot any of these on your property. And as we continue to get funding and work through these samples, we'll be finding more, more species um, and more different farms. All right, so what are the main threats to native bees? Why are 31% of the species we have a rank for um, vulnerable? Well, we've got our four main problems and they're big ones. So habitat loss, pesticide use, introduced pests and diseases, and climate change. Uh, and these are big issues, and they're not things that any one person can tackle on their own. Um, but you're a group here. I'm, I'm thrilled to be talking to you, a neighborhood group. These are things that we can work on and can tackle together. Here are some responses to some of those issues. Issues of habitat loss. We can conserve habitat where there is still good habitat. And where habitat has been lost, we can create more habitat. I'm going to talk about this more. Pesticide use, uh, as much as possible, where you can reduce your pesticide use, um, especially in your own homes and gardens, and particularly um, pesticide use that's just for cosmetic purposes. Uh, those are, are easy ones to get rid of. Uh, introduce pests and diseases. This is uh, something that is a big problem for our bee species. And something you can do to help is if you're interested in purchasing mason bees, which is a fun thing to do with your family, purchase them locally. Please don't ship bees um, across distances. Don't bring in any bee species by mail uh, because that's a really good way to bring in new pests and diseases and species that aren't here. Climate change. I mean, that's, that's a doozy. That's a big one. Um, some things we can do along with all of the other climate change related strategies you can take, you can also work on climate proofing your yard. And that also involves planting native species that are drought resistant uh, and that are gonna support our native pollinators. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about habitat creation and how we can do that within our yards. And so the first thing I told you about specialist bees, bees that have requirements for the plant that they need. If their specific plant isn't there, they won't be there. And so when you're thinking about adding more plants to your yard, um, doing some more landscaping, I would really encourage you to look for native plants. So these are plants that are naturally uh, occurring here in our ecosystem. They have long-standing evolutionary relationships with the bees that are here. And if you plant native plants, you're also supporting specialist bees. And so these are some examples of native plants that we know have specialist bees that depend on them. So things like our native willows, really early season spring forage for food, and they have many specialist bees attached to them. Goldenrod is another plant with a lot of specialists. Douglas aster, gumweed. Uh, gumweed is just starting to bloom and it has so many interesting bees on it. Uh, that's one just sit and take an hour watching a gumweed and seeing all, all the different bees coming through it. Um, pestamens as well support native bees. And the Native Bee Society of BC has recently created this forage list. And so this is um, pointing out the top 10 plants for specialist bees here on the Pacific coast. And so what we did is we looked and found plants that had a specialist bee 
that use them and that both the specialist bee and the plant occur here on the Pacific coast in our region. And so if you're looking for some, some plants uh, to put into your garden, these are some suggestions uh, for plants that are gonna be supporting those specialist bees. And the great thing is they also support our generalist bees. Generalist bees are not fussy. And so they're able to use whatever you plant as long as it has accessible pollen and nectar. So by focusing on specialist bees and native species, both plants and bees, we're supporting many bees. Uh, so you can get this guide here on our website. Another thing to think about when you're looking at your yard and think about how you can make it more pollinator friendly, are there flower resources all year? We have bees that show up in the spring, our queen bumblebees coming out of hibernation, single moms looking for food. We need resources early in the spring and we need resources all through the summer and right late into the fall to support all of the bees that are coming out throughout the year. And so again, these are all native species that are options that you could put into your yard from our really early things like hazelnut um, to, to our late blooming things like pearly everlasting and hardhack uh, and all our mid-season plants. Canis is a bee magnet. Woolly sunflower is beautiful and attracts loads of bees. Um, strawberries, yarrow, trillium, uh, as many different native species as you can and trying to have them blooming throughout the year. And in addition to floral resources throughout the year, we also want diversity in our floral resources. Native bees don't come in only one size or shape, and so our flowers shouldn't either. And so a diversity of colors, sizes, shapes are all gonna support a diversity of bees. And even if you don't wanna plant anything more, leave the flowers for the bees. There's always spaces. Um, let, your, let your brassicas bolt, leave your dandelions in your lawn, you know, these are a bunch of um, parsley and cilantro, let them bloom, and even clover, leaving clover in your lawn. These are all ways of providing more floral resources. And then of course, bees need a place to nest. Uh, and so nesting resources, how can we provide nests for our bees? Uh, so this is uh, nesting for tunnel nesting bees. Uh, and so a lot of people may have already done these. You can drill out a block of wood, and what you're doing when you do that is you're really trying to mimic nature. And so in nature, those bees would be using old dead trees with beetle holes in them. And so even before you're, you're going out and creating any more nest blocks, think about what you already have. Are there already snags on your property you could conserve? Are there blocks of wood, you know, logs and things like that that you could retain? Those provide great habitat value for any of bees. And if you are gonna create your own, again, a lot of people will say, what, what's the exact hole size I need to drill in order to create a habitat for native bees? Native bees don't come in just one hole size. Use every drill bit in your toolbox. Put in as many different hole sizes as you can. Different bees will use the different hole sizes and try as much as possible to mimic nature. And so that means not a whole bunch of bees all stuffed together in one space. Spread these blocks out, make sure your holes are well spaced apart and let your blocks break down. You know, cycle them out every couple of years as pests and diseases find them. And of course, stem nesting. Uh, this is again, a way that bees will create and use tunnel nests. And so when you're cleaning up your garden, whether these are native plants or not, if you can leave the stems long, uh, bees will use those. And so this is a tiny little bee using a little hollow stem left here. And I've left these stems in my garden. I've chopped, just chopped them up back a little bit. Um, and the plants are growing up over them. And soon you won't even be able to tell that the stems are there. But I can sit and watch these little bees going in and out, building their nests. Bare soil, 70% of our bees are ground nesting. Are there areas in your yard where there is bare soil? Uh, this can include things like crummy lawns celebrate your patchy lawn where there's access to the soil for the native bees. And so here, here's an example of a little bee nest kind of just down there in the ground. Uh, this is a bank, a south facing bank uh, along the road in the ditch by my house. And there's so many bees that use this exposed soil because they can get at it and they can nest. Uh, and then this is our septic field, which is a, a raised septic field and it's, it's sandy. 
things don't grow that great in it, but there's so much access to soil. And then the same thing with the little, little rock wall here, many spots where bees can get in and get through those cracks and get at that soil that they need to, to be able to dig those nests. And there's still lots more to learn about native bees. Um, there's no way I could get it all in, uh, in this brief presentation. But if you're interested in more info, here's some books that I'd recommend. Um, the Bees in Your Backyard is great if you want to learn more about the different kinds of bees. Attracting Native Pollinators from the Xerces Society, uh, again, it goes through all sorts of detail about how to make a property really bee friendly. Uh, and this is a, a guide from Pollinator Partnership Canada. It's specifically for our region. It's selecting plants for pollinators for the Eastern Vancouver Island eco region. Uh, and this is a free online download and it gives you a list of plants that might be good ones. Um, of course, you can also check out the Native Bee Society. The Xerces Society has lots of information. Uh, and if you're looking for native plants and seeds, uh, I know you're down in Salt Spring, so you probably have hopefully a native plant nursery in your own area. Uh, Streamside Native Plants is one up near where I am in the Comox Valley, uh, but Satin Flower Nurseries in Victoria uh, might also be close enough that you could pick up stuff from there and they will ship seed. Uh, and then finally, this QR code and this link here at the bottom are to my project, looking at the pollinators in Vancouver Island agriculture. Uh, and so again, if you're interested in what, what bees might appear on your property, checking out this bee list there. And I think that's everything that I have to tell you, but I would be delighted to take any questions uh, that anyone has. And would you like me to stop screen sharing or should I leave this up if anyone wants to follow some of those links? Maybe just maybe Bonnie just leave them up so they can be followed. Although I think Erin Ann has been getting them into the chat, but um, I think we have a few questions. Um, I, you want me to ask the questions? Sure. So our first question is, what is the easiest way to attract bees to your garden? Which that was a question early on in the talk. And I think you've answered quite a few of those, but would you like to just go over the main points? Sure, I, I can say it again. You know, have things that are flowering that those bees can use. Uh, make sure there's things in bloom from early spring right through to fall. Um, and, you know, attract the greatest diversity of bees to your garden by having a high diversity of blooms and by attracting native plants. And then just conserving. A lot of habitat is actually conservation, you know, conserving logs that bees can nest in, conserving areas with bare soil, conserving stems, uh, and making those spaces safe and accessible to bees. Great. I'm just writing some of those points in the chat. Um, another question is, how do the cuckoo bees find the nests? Do they follow the females? I don't remember you talking about cuckoo bees. Do you wanna mention what those are? Yeah, so the cuckoo bees are the parasitic bees. So they're the ones that rather than creating their own nests are looking for the nests of the other females. And so when you, when you find them, you can often see them actually flying very low to the ground. Once you know what they look like, kind of sweeping back and forth, you don't see them on flowers as often because they don't have to collect pollen, but you'll see them searching the ground, trying to find it. And I'm sure that there's some scent cues there as well uh, that they'll be using to find those nests. And they often have you know, specific species that they'll use. So you'll have one species of um, a kokubi or a parasitic bee, and it'll focus on one or a few related species of non-parasitic bees that it will use. And so it, it, they come out of the same nest, uh, because they go in and they lay their eggs and their babies develop in those nests and then they'll kind of come out about it at the same time uh, and then be searching around that same area trying to find the nests and then there's all sorts of interesting chemical warf warfare things that go on with, with those guys uh, if you look at them they're often um, the cuckoo bees the parasitic bees are really heavily armored and punctured and they often have funny spines and spikes on them uh, and so they they look just a lot more, um, a lot meaner. Uh, and so the, the theory is that that's probably because they probably end up in fights when uh, a mother bee comes back and finds, you know, these cuckoo bees 
in her nest. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a whole bunch of interesting things. A lot of them we're still trying to figure out, you know, what, what species are parasitic on which, how do they find each other? And what are, what are the mother bees that created the nest? What are they doing to try and protect their nests against these cuckoo bees? And so we have some bee species where multiple females will each produce their own nest, but they'll have a common entrance. Um, and so this is possibly, again, a response to these parasitic bees and that you know there, there's usually a female there in the entrance to stop the parasitic bees from getting in. Hmm. That's great. Oh, thank you. Uh, we have another question. How large of an area do bees stay in during a season? That's a great question. Hmm. So it really depends on size. Uh, so a bumblebee can probably forage you know, for a kilometer away from its nest. They're big, big bodied, they can fly far and fast. Uh, and bees are what we call central place foragers. And so that means they have a spot where their nest is. And so wherever their nest is, they go out from that spot, collect resources and come back. And so they're always going out and coming back. And so each individual bee's range will be centered around its nest. So a bumblebee might have quite a large range, but a small bee, some of these tiny little bees that we have, you know, that are, you know, under five millimeters long, those bees may only go a hundred meters from their nest. And this is actually one of the things that makes providing habitat for bees something that's really possible within one yard or one neighborhood is that these bees aren't necessarily going to go really far. And so if you're supporting bees within your property, they're, they're going to be staying there as long as you're providing everything that they need they're there and their populations will build up from year to year. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have another question, is nectar enough or do bees also need water? Great question. Um, bees, nectar, depending on you know, uh, what the flower is, it can have varying concentrations of sugar in it. Um, I have, do sometimes see bees coming and drinking and so providing a water source is a really helpful thing to do. Honeybees are the bees that I see most often using those water sources. And honeybees will often bring water back to their hives and actually use it to cool the hives, uh, where the other bees don't do that. But they do still need some water. And so if you're able to provide a, a shallow tray of water, like maybe a bird bath with some rocks and things in it, so they can land and get in without drowning, that's going to be really helpful um, for them. And as well, you know, some of our bees, our mason bees, use mud. Uh, and so they need a, a damp, muddy place where they can, they can get that mud. And so thinking about the other things the bees need, our leafcutter bees need plants that they can cut little, little circle holes out of um, and use. And so all of our bees have different things that they need. And the more of those that we can support, the better. Thank you. We have another question. Will the specialist bees feed from plants in the same species, for example, other asters, or is it only the Douglas aster? That's a great question. So specialist and generalist bee, they seem like two really distinct categories, but there's actually a lot of gradations between them. Uh, so we have some bees that are super specialized and may only use one species of other plant. And we have other bees that are still specialized, but they may be specialized on asters in general. And so whether it's a Douglas aster or a California aster, they're not that picky. They'll use all of the asters. And so this, this is quite common. We have a number of aster specialists that will use many different species of asters, but they won't use things in the other families. And then we have, you know, other specialist bees. So, you know, for example, we have um, a fun one to talk about is the death camas mining bee. And so for those of you that know death camas, it's a poisonous plant uh, and its pollen is also poisonous to most bees. Um, but there is a specialist bee that uses only death camas and it will only collect death camas pollen and use that to feed its young. And so in that case, you know, you've got a really tight relationship. The plant has only one bee that pollinates it and the bee only goes to and uses that plant. Uh, and so it can vary between really tight relationships and, and fairly loose relationships. Thanks so much. Um, 
We have a comment here. Our yellow-faced bumblebees have been skinning the ground rather than accessing the flowers around. What is the bee doing? Great question. So if it's a really big bee and it's early in spring, you're probably seeing a queen. And one of the things that they will do early in the spring is they will look for nest sites. And this is a behavior they do. Go back and forth, low to the ground. You'll see them checking out anything that looks like a bit of a hollow or a crevice or crawling under leaves or under logs. And they're looking for appropriate nest sites. Uh, and I did specifically talk about bumpy nesting, but bumpies are what we call cavity nesters. And so that means that they're gonna find a, a little hollow or a space or a cavity, and they're gonna use that to build their nest. Uh, and often these cavities are things like mouse nests. This mice will dug a little burrow and then it's a nice little insulated space in there. So they may be looking for a mouse nest. Uh, they'll often also make nests in things like birdhouses. Again, it's an enclosed space with a little entrance that's reasonably defensible and it's probably already got some insulating material in it. And their other favorite place to nest uh, seems to be that pink insulation. Uh, so if they can find like a little way to get into the wall of your house or, you know, a shed uh, and get into that pink insulation, you'll often find bumblebees nesting in spaces. Uh, and if you do, if you find a bumblebee nesting in a spot you don't want them to be, the thing to remember is bumblebees have a one-year colony life cycle. So in the fall, that whole colony will die. You can clean it up and seal up whatever little graph gap or crevice they're using to get into that space where you don't want them nesting and they won't be back next year. So if you can put up with it for a year, that's often the best. Good advice, thanks. Uh, on the topic of bumblebees still, someone heard that you shouldn't cut your grass in the heat of the afternoon because the bumblebees rest in the grass then. Is this true? Hmm. The one that I've specifically heard uh, we have some species, and, and particularly males, so female bees have their nests that they tend to go back to uh, and stay in at night, but a lot of our male bees don't have a nest. They don't contribute anything to the nesting process. They don't collect any pollen, uh, and so they will just be out, and they often hang out on flowers because that's where the females are, uh, and they're looking for females, so we will often have male bees doing things like sleeping in flowers at night. Uh, and so I would be probably more concerned uh, about at night, there potentially be stuff in there. And, you know, because they're slow and it's cold, it's going to be harder for them to get away. Uh, whereas when it's quite warm out in the heat of the day, uh, those bees should be able to, you know, be active and move and get out of the way as you're mowing. But I hadn't, I hadn't specifically heard a um, suggestion about not cutting your grass in the heat of the day. Okay. And our last question here is, is the bumble in bumblebees important in the way of the, the vibrations? Bee vibrations are super important. Uh, bumblebees and a lot of our other native bees do some cool things uh, that honeybees don't do. And one of them is buzz pollination. And so this is where a bumblebee will grasp onto a flower and it will vibrate the flower at just the right frequency to cause all the pollen to come flying out in a big cloud, like poof. Um, and so some plants, things like tomatoes, require a buzz pollination. And so that's one of the reasons why bumblebees are such important pollinators of tomatoes. And they're actually reared and released into commercial tomato greenhouses to pollinate those flowers because they do that buzz pollination. Uh, you can also often hear this roses are, are a flower. If you watch a bumblebee or some of our other native bee species on a rose, you can sometimes hear them as, as they'll be crawling around, gathering all the pollen, and you'll hear them going, beep, 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 and they're vibrating and doing that again. Um, sonicating is another word we use for it, where they're trying to, to get that pollen to release. Um, bumblebees also will use vibrations to warm themselves up. You know, we have bumblebees out really early in the season uh, before it's particularly warm out. Uh, and another reason why these native bees are really important, and we don't want to rely solely on honeybees for pollination, uh, is that honeybees are warm weather flyers. They like to stay in their hives where it's warm and cozy. Uh, but bumblebees, they're single moms. They don't have a store of honey. They have to get out and get moving. And so they will, again, vibrate 
they, they'll take those really big wing muscles that they have, they're big bees, big wing muscles, and they'll vibrate their wing muscles and actually produce heat uh, until they've warmed their core body temperature up enough that they can get out and they can fly. Uh, and so those vibrations are super important. Although I've never heard anyone refer to it as the bumble in the bumblebees before. <laughs> Um, I have a last question for myself. We've talked a lot about bees, uh, honeybees, native bees. Can you just mention other pollinators such as wasps or other uh, insects around that are pollinating um, in our native environment? Absolutely. Yeah, so bees are not the only pollinators by a long shot. Flies are also super important pollinators, um, especially again, of some things that are earlier season. Um, flies can fly at pretty low temperatures. Um, we also have wasps. Everybody loves to hate wasps, but wasps are really important for pollination as well as being very important for pest control. Um, butterflies are another one that people tend to think of in terms of pollination because we often see them on flowers. And really any species that will visit a flower and move from one flower to the next can act as a pollinator. People can act as a pollinator. I know, I know some people who go out and pollinate their cherries in the early spring with an electric toothbrush. Um, but the reason we tend to talk about bees is because bees reproductive success depends on how many flowers they can visit because they feed their offspring solely on pollen. And so they will visit many, many, many flowers and they have many specialized adaptations for collecting that pollen, which helps them as they're moving from flower to flower that they're carrying a lot of it with them. Uh, most of our other species that are also visiting flowers, they're doing it just for their own personal consumption. So they'll go, they'll visit a flower, they'll feed on some pollen and nectar, maybe they'll visit two or three flowers, but then they're full. And so then they move off and do something else. Bumblebees keep, or bees in general, continue to visit flowers all day long. But yes, there are definitely other species that are also super important um, for pollination. Bonnie, this has been wonderful. Just great source of information. I can't resist. Last question. Do you have a favorite bee? I do. And you told me you're going to ask me this. So let me see if I, I've got a picture of it. There we go. Uh, oh, so, yes. I mean, I don't, I can't really say I have a favorite, but I really like this one. Uh, so this is a tiny little mason bee um, and it's called Osmia kincaidii. And it is tiny, 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 and bright metallic green. Uh, and I never saw this species around my yard until I put in some native plantings. And one of the flowers I planted, it's an annual called Small Flowered Blue-Eyed Mary. Uh, and it's very early spring and it comes up and it's these tiny blue flowers. Um, and this bee goes for them. And I don't see it on the other species in my yard, but by putting in that one species, now I can watch these little tiny green jewels uh, early in the spring, going from flower to flower to flower. Uh, and this is the hairy belly bee. So you can see all the hairs yes. under the belly uh, and it'll be a tunnel nester. And though so I have not spotted it nesting anywhere yet. So I'm still looking to see if I can figure out where in my property it's nesting. So does the flower grow around your property anyways? So the bee would have been there and, or, or how did the bee get, get to you? That is a great question. So um, it's a native species, but I hadn't seen it growing anywhere else nearby. Um, so it's, um, I don't know. I don't know where the bee came from. And I don't know that this species is a specialist. It can use a number of other species. So it may have been in the neighborhood already, but it's, it's really amazing how, even though they're tiny little bees, they don't fly very far, and yet they're able to find the right habitat. Uh, and so this is a case of, you know, build it and, and they will come. You know, sometimes people say, where, where do I buy mason bees? How can I purchase bees and bring them in? And my response is create the habitat, put in the plants that these bees need, make sure there's nesting spaces, whether those are things you build yourself or even better, things you conserve around your neighborhood, stems, logs, bare soil, and the bees will find you. So they'll find the habitat and they'll start their colonies um, and their nesting spaces and they'll go on their own. So we should, we should start planting more and more and, and a, a real diversity of mm -hmm. native plants and see what we come up with. 
Well, Bonnie, I can't thank you enough. This has really been fascinating. I mean, I could probably keep you going all evening with questions, but um, people have busy lives. So thanks again for giving such a wonderful presentation. And thanks to Foundation of Salt Spring for supporting our pollinator project on um, our little community group on Roman Road. And particularly thanks to Transitions and Erin Ann for handling all the technical stuff. And thank you everybody for showing up.